We got Coach Gothier on. We are going to talk about Badgers basketball heading into March. What has he seen on James Madison watching some of that film? How does he feel going into that matchup? Did anything change for the Badgers in the Big Ten tournament? We got a lot to talk about. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers, your team every day. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Today's episode brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Uh, and let's just jump into it. We got Coach back on second time. I uh, really do appreciate uh, you jumping on, man. We, we last talked. I'm trying to remember which game did we talk before last time? It was it was after it was after the Indiana game. Okay, so the the depths of the season, the dark spot. Yes. Uh, since then, obviously, every all the veteran fans know what happened. Um, I wanted to ask you, watching when you and I text a lot um, behind the scenes, but did you see anything change in the Big Ten tournament for the Badgers to kind of put together that stretch, beat Purdue, almost beat Illinois? Yeah, Ron, it, it's great to be back with you uh yeah the, the 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 great thing about the big 10 tournaments i saw a lot of good things since the last time we we spoke specifically on the offense and you know chucky and steven crow really got more aggressive with their offense um but i thought really why their offense kind of took off in my opinion is they're really the ball movement was so much better they were really really working it around side to side, making the defense switch. And they were throwing the ball inside consistently to Crowell and Wall and getting those spots up, you know, getting guys spotted up and we're getting a lot of open looks. And I think also offensively is I think AJ's shot selection was much better. And, you know, as you could see throughout the Big Ten tournament, he was in constant attack mode. And then when he was in that, he started to get more uncontested, threes on the perimeter I just thought in general overall I thought the, their ball movement their shot selection paint touches post touches were so much better than you know it was in the previous month did it feel like early season Badgers to you it did it did it, it, it felt like it they just had that flow and that rhythm um you could see the confidence building you know I think a lot of it you know you you and I have talked a lot off air and stuff that they go as Steven Crowell goes, um, you know, and so he's really picked it up. But also Chucky, when Chucky is aggressive and looking for his shots, uh, I just thought Chucky went a whole nother level and he hasn't played like that since, like you said, the beginning of the year. And I think I think that has a lot to do with it. And I think AJ was getting his shots, but they seemed less forced. And that's kind of like in the beginning of the year when he was putting up big numbers, it wasn't, you know, ISO or him trying to create something. It was kind of within the flow of the offense. And I just think, you know, over in the Big Ten tournament, it just, you know, they they got that style of playing that feeling back that it kind of did remind of the early part of the year Badgers. Yeah. I want to pick you on Stephen Crawl quick because this is something you and I have talked about too. It's something, listen, Badger fans talk about it, right? Shoot the ball. Be more aggressive. Why? Why do you think in his his fourth season there's still that on and off switch there? Why? Why do we go into every game wondering how aggressive he's going to be? Seemingly, Greg Gard does too, because Greg Gard talks about it. Yeah, I think a lot of it. it it's a great point, Ryan. But I think a lot of it has to do with I think his confidence, uh, his self confidence in his own ability. Because you can see, like in the second matchup with Purdue when he went scoreless or whatever, you could just tell from the get-go that, you know, I wouldn't say he was intimidated, but you could just see he didn't have a lot of confidence. He didn't think he could get a lot of a lot accomplished. And I, I think, I think you know, not being around him and knowing him, seeing him in practice every day, I, I get the, you know, just from the outside looking in, I get the perspective that I think he's pretty hard on himself. And so I think when things don't initially go well for him, I think I think you know it kind of puts him in a bad place from an offensive standpoint, and he more defers to others than take that aggression. Because like like you said, he's shooting over forty percent 
from the three-point season, but you know he hasn't taken a lot of threes. You know, if you would like to see a guy who shoots that well from three take more shots. But then you could kind of see the changes in, in his mentality and his confidence level against Edie in the Big Ten semifinal game. The very first possession when they kind of he got called on the foul and they came together and they got locked up. You could tell crowd went right after him and and start, got in his face and basically was saying, "Hey, hey." Hey, big boy, I'm, you know, this, this is a different me. And I think that little play, that little come together like that and Krause holding his ground and, and fighting back, I think that just kind of sent a message for the Badgers to Purdue that, hey, we're, 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 we're here to fight today. And you could see it throughout the game because they just constantly would take a punch and they would throw a punch and take a punch and throw a punch. And then, in the end, they f- they found a way to win. I mean, they get they get the basket late to go to overtime, and half their roster basically fouls out, and and they figure they found a way to win. And I just think you haven't really seen that toughness or fight from the Badgers in a long time. It, w- it was great to see. Uh, two two questions off of that. The first is, what as a coach, um, what did you think of the officiating? in that Purdue game specifically, because I I was extremely frustrated. I, I felt like it was a inconsistent, which every, you just want consistency to some degree, but it, it felt like right. the refs didn't have an idea of how to handle Zach Eady. Yeah. And, and I'm, you know, you and I have talked in the past and, you know, from the coaching staffs that I've been at various stops, we've never been one much to talk about officiating or get into officiating because I think you have too many, as a coach, you have too many of your own problems to worry Mm -hmm. about in terms of coaching your team and doing this. But I agree with you after watching the Purdue for the third time, I got extremely frustrated um, with that game on Saturday, more specifically in the fact that, he just didn't know what a foul was. For example, the Badgers, I mean, you brought it up the other day when he talked about when Crow or store, one of them went to the basket and got raked across the face on by Edie. And there was no, there was no foul call. And you said he looked like he just got back from Gettysburg. You know, there's no foul call on that. And then the very next possession down the floor, they throw it in the post to Edie. And I don't know if it was winner or wall, but they just put their forearm and in this back, you know, to position, play positionally defense in the post, and they call a foul. And it's like, yeah. I just, that, and I really think, I'll be interested to see what happens in the tournament, and I really think part of the struggles with Purdue the last couple of years in the tournament is Edie is so protected by the Big Ten offici- officials that I just don't think they get that protection when it when they get into the big tournament and i think i think it's a huge benefit i mean look for example in that game purdue shot 34 free throws ed on his own shot 19 and i think the badgers shot 15 for the game 14 for the game you know it was physical on both ends i I know the badgers don't have an ed and i agree he's going to get more fouls called but that kind of discrepancy you know i just it it just as a coach all you want is consistency right. and for and for them to call it the same way on both ends and i you know i got i got to agree with you on on this occasion i just didn't feel like the badgers were getting the same type of whistle let, let me ask you this and there's no right or wrong answer to this one i, I think cuz every coach is different but badger fans will get frustrated that gray guard at times doesn't have kind of that bull ryan response to officiating right to to when the calls go a certain way when there's a trend of it um is there anything to yelling at the ref no that's a great question because you know i i that whole to me personally the whole philosophy of working the officials you know the old bobby knight days and even now you and i both as badger fans you you can't say that mike shashevsky at halftime of that national championship game against duke it completely changed from the second half to the first half so but i think in general that philosophy of working the officials and trying to get a call i don't think that works in my opinion anymore but 
like, like you said, we saw the national championship game. I, I don't care what anybody can say, whether you're a Duke fan, a Wisconsin fan, or just a fan in general. The officiating changed the moment Coach K walked off that floor and were in the official's ear. And, and the staff do a good job because you don't really see them working the officials or riding the officials i think they more worry about coaching their own team and what they can control i know as a a fan you would like to see you know guard you know get in an official's face and stuff like that but i really especially on that level those officials have such big egos anyway and they're so good at their jobs i mean you're talking the best of the best and they know how to work a game and they let coaches and players talk to them a lot more than say the level we are on but, uh, you know, I just think I just think that doesn't really work because I think in the end, if you're known as a whiner and a complainer, I think you're going to get more calls against you than you are for for you. Um, you know, but I just think the Big Ten and a lot of leagues, you know, I think Kansas, I think certain players you see it in the NBA all the time. I think certain players get protected by the officials. And there's not a lot of times where Wisconsin has that Zach Eady type, you know, player of the year type guy. Like I think when they had Johnny Davis, I think he got a lot of calls. And I think the batters got a lot of calls because, you know, he was a first team all American type. I really, I really think, you know, the better player you are, you tend to get more calls. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And I'd also point out, you got to be true to who you are too. Like if it's not in, like if Greg Guard's not somebody who's going to do that, it, then it's not going to work for him anyway. It worked for Bo Ryan a little bit because that's who Bo Ryan was. you got to be true to who you are. Um, so right. I, I do agree to that point as well. All right, we're going to take a quick break, talk a little bit about where uh, Scott Coach thinks this uh, team is heading into March. And we're going to start breaking down JMU a little bit, James Madison University. And what did we see on film? What did he see on film watching them? That's coming up next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, a quick break for our friends of the show over at Nissan Motors. Every week, we're picking one team, one team with March Madness coming up that has pushed it a little further than the rest. Just like any, just like any of the all new uh, 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. We got to talk about the Yukon Huskies. They can only be described as an armada. This top seeded team is as hardcore as it gets out there. So it's no wonder they've landed the top overall seed in the NCAA tournament. They won their conference tournament. They are one of the favorites to win it all, despite four of the six Power Six Conference champions standing in their way in their region. But they are an absolute powerhouse, just like the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada. Go find your next big adventure. Whatever it is, whoever you're taking with you, let Nissan help you get there. Go find out their selection of SUVs at shop Nissan or U NissanUSA.com. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by our great friends of the show over at FanDuel, the number one sports book in America. That's why we use it. That's why Locked On uses it. That's why I use it. FanDuel.com slash Locked On. Get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 in bonus bets to use however you want if your $5 bet wins. Put 5 bucks in there. Bet on the Badgers to be JMU. We'll see what Coach Gothier thinks about that, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, and, well, I already have my money in there, and it's already on Wisconsin winning this game. Right now, that's a great new offer for new customers. 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines, uh, baseball's coming up, basketball, NBA playoffs, March Madness. It's all there. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel Sportsbook, FanDuel.com slash locked on. Visit FanDuel.com and bet on college troops until they cut down the nets. All right, let's get Coach back in here. Um, Coach, let, let's talk a little bit. Um, just how, where, where do you think this team is right now heading into March? How do you feel about them? You know, like we talked about earlier, you know, I really like the aggressiveness from Chucky and Crow. Um, I really like the ball movement and the player movement that they've had the past week, week, two weeks. Um, I really feel good where they are offensively. Um, I don't feel confident. I know we talked about it the last time we got together about their defense. Now I thought against Maryland bet I would say defensively they were more locked in where I thought they were much more aware of getting to the help and and battling and you know digging uh, but obviously those teams are more offensively challenged than Illinois and I think 
they took defensively, they took another step back. I mean, they gave up 93 and they gave up 60 to Damask and Shannon. And, you know, they, and they gave up 13 offensive rebounds. And I, those offensive rebounds were the killer. Cause I think at one point it was a tie game. Illinois missed a three. They got an offensive rebound. They kicked it out and they hit, they hit the second chance three. And I really, you know, I, I just think, and then we talked about it. I was texting you in the first half, Shannon, you know, hit those two transition threes where they just didn't pick them up, you know? So I think defensively, I'm still a little nervous in terms of where the Badgers are defensively. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, Shannon, especially in the Big Ten tournament, I mean, he was a dude. I, I know he dropped 35 or whatever on the Badgers. He dropped 40 the day before, 38 the day. I mean, it, it's hard to stop. It's hard to stop him when, when somebody's that good like he is. But I just would, you know, eventually if the Badgers want to win – in the tournament and get to the second weekend, they got to figure out how to get some stops. You can't just outscore people. I don't, I, they, they're very good if, offensively. I just don't think they're that good where they just going to say, we're going to get in a, you know, a shootout and win it. That's, I just don't think they can do that. Yeah. And that brings it to the next point. Can they be good enough defensively? Because I think you and I would both agree. Well, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but they're not going to be a great defensive team. That switch doesn't suddenly turn on. But can, can they yep. be good enough defensively so that offensive efficiency can bring them past um, James Madison and then a, a Duke-Vermont team potentially, whoever's in that second round? Can they get enough stops to do that? Because I, I actually thought there were moments during the stretch where it looks like they're a little more connected, the rotations were a little bit better, but then there'd just be lapses where they would leave a guy or they wouldn't pick somebody up in transition. Um, can they string enough stops together? What do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because I do agree with you. If you watch, obviously the Maryland game, the Northwestern game, but I think specifically in that Purdue game, you know there was a stretch where the Badgers I think went one for ten from the field, but they got stops from Purdue. So they, I think, I I think the lead didn't change because I don't think I think each team scored once in like a ten position. There was like a five minute span where basically neither team scored and you're talking Purdue's really good offensively. So the Badgers show flashes of it. And like I said, I really thought during the big 10 tournament, they did a much better job. You know, you and I've talked about it all year about getting over ball screens. I yeah. thought they did a much better job, especially against Purdue um, fighting over those screens, getting back squared up with the ball. And like I said, I thought they were more engaged at the midline or in the help on the help D defense where they're really you know they were they were flying to the help a lot better and they're they were rotating on the back side and taking away some of those look, looks but then like you said then they had those lapses which and I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's a coaching staff philosophy that they have or if it's just individual breakdowns from players but they just constantly give up where they a team posts it into the post to the big and the, the Badgers defender leaves the ball, ball side help shooter. And that's the easiest pass for a big to pass right back out. And I think uh, it happened two times in the Purdue game and a couple of times in the Illinois game. And I just, that's the easiest pass if you're doubling the post out of it. So, so I'm I, like I said, I don't want to assume if that's how they play it or if it's just individual breakdowns. But stuff like that, especially come Friday night, the way JMU shoots it, you know they, they got to clean. They got to clean that up. Yeah, I, I'm be super curious to see how how they want that defended because it, it almost feels like I, I know Klesman was a guy who did that um, coming off that ball side wing, come down doubling, giving up a shot. Klesman's veteran enough; it doesn't feel like he's freestyling that. It almost feels like that's something they're trying to do, but I don't know. I it's it's very odd, and you and I were texting about that. Um, Speaking of JMU, we're going to take one break. We're going to come back and talk about their ability to shoot, their ability to get in transition a little bit, also their lack of size. You know, where do the Badgers match up with James Madison here? We're going to talk about that next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, one more quick break for our friends of the show over at Amazon Fire TV. And I've talked about it before. I love talking about products that I use. My Amazon Fire Stick is plugged into my smart TV. It gives me all the sports I want. Um, a lot of other stuff, too, like cooking shows, entertainment shows, gaming shows. You can get a lot on your Amazon Fire TV, your Amazon channels over at Amazon.com slash TV. They've recently created Fire TV channels. 
to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands and other content for free, which includes all of us over here at Locked On Badgers, uh, Locked On, Locked the Locked On Network, most of the big sports leagues as well, all the conferences. Uh, Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep you up to date on the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, which is firing up, and lots more. Like I said, not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos. It's all there free. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. That's amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, let's get Coach back up. Coach, let's talk James Madison. Um, I want to start here because this is a 31-3 and team, right, but also a 31-3 and team that has, according to basketball reference, and there's different metrics, but the 276th strength of schedule in the in the country. How do you as a coaching staff look at a team that's had a lot of success but done it against mostly a, a not very difficult schedule? Because, you know, everybody looks at the 31-3 and three record, which – I don't care what level you are or who you're playing against. You win 31 games. Um, you know, that's that's a heck of a season, and, and you're a really good basketball team. But like you said, if you dive into it, um, you know, other than the, the very first game at Michigan State that they won in overtime, their only other quad one or two games were the two against Appalachian State, who, who are about 143-ish in uh, Ken Palm or whatever whatever, and they lost both of those games to Appalachian State. So out of those 31 wins, you know, one of them are a quad one, quad two uh, win. So, you know, that's that's a big difference, you know, and they, they've had a heck of a season. I don't want to take anything away from them. But, you know, beating Texas State and Arkansas State and those type of schools is not Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, as a coaching staff – you just try to you, you really overplay your opponent because you talk about, hey, guys, they're 31 and three. They got it. Now, that one thing, they got a lot of old, experienced guys, a lot of guys that played on the power five level, a lot of guys that have produced their whole college career. Um, so, you know, you, you talk to your team about that, you know, because you can't take them lightly. But you also tell them, like, you know, they we're good, too. You know, and they just got done. The Badgers went, just went toe to toe with Northwestern, toe to toe with Purdue. Went, were right into it. It was a tie game with Illinois with about two and a half minutes left. I mean, if the Badgers play like that, I know JMU's good, and I, you know, I respect them and stuff. But they haven't seen a team like the Badgers, and I know everybody talks about they won at Michigan State and this and that. And yeah, it was a great win, but. I don't know how you feel, Ryan, but I mean, the Badgers handled Michigan State twice themselves. Mm -hmm. And it still blows my mind how the committee could make a Michigan State team that has 14 losses on the season, how they're a nine seed. Wow. Uh, you know, so JMU, it's a great win for JMU, but I wouldn't get overblown with that because the Badgers have handled Michigan State twice. And I just don't think Michigan State is very good, in my opinion. Yeah, I, listen. I the Michigan State thing gets gets gives them a lot of credit, which it should. But that's a Michigan State team in the first game of a year, which can be always be a little fluky. And it's a Michigan State team that shot one of twenty from three in that game. I went I went back actually today. Yeah, good I looked point. At every every three point attempt. And there, listen, you always give some credit. Uh, James Madison is is athletic. They get after it defensively. There was eight or nine really good looks in that game for Michigan state that they yeah. just clanked, they airballed um, again, take nothing away from J a wins a win, but that is a, a you're going to beat most teams. If they shoot one for 20 from three is what I would say. Uh, I, where, where can they beat Absolutely. Wisconsin? Where, where do they give Wisconsin trouble? Um, watching some of the film on them. I know I'll just say one of my concerns watching it is Wisconsin's perimeter defense has not been that great this year. And JMU's got a couple people that can really fill it up from the perimeter. That could be an issue. Yeah, no, I, I you're, I mean, it, it's, you're right on, Ryan. I mean, that's where that my biggest concern is, is, you know, we talked about Wisconsin has the worst three point defensive field goal percentage in the big 10. And that's where JMU, they're really good at the three point line. Um, they're really good on the perimeter. So like you said, that the first key for the Badgers is that perimeter defense. J 
JMU has guys that can create off the bounce. They got uh, Friedel, who is, you know, South Dakota State transfer. He can really stroke it. So they got athletic guys that can get into the paint, and you got the shooter spotted up out on the paint. And then the other thing I think the real key for the Badgers that they got to be concerned with is JMU's 14th in the country in turnover margin. Um, and, you know, that they, they, they average nine steals a game. So, you know, we've seen the Badgers, especially in that swoon in February, have problems taking care of the ball, especially taking the care of the ball early. And so I think that's really that's really important for the Badgers is, you know, they can't come out, you know, in the first 10 minutes of that game Friday night and just have those silly unforced turnovers because, you know, I, I really think I know the Badgers can score and score a lot, but I really think the Badgers don't want to get in a shootout because I, I think if – the batters slow it down and make it a possession by possession game. I don't think James Madison has the horses to beat the Badgers in a possession by possession game. But if you start getting up and down and it starts turning into a three point contest, um, that things could get scary. No, that's a great point with the turnovers because the turnovers lead to transition looks where the Badgers have struggled this year picking up shooters in transition, which is what James Madison, they will shoot quickly in the shot clock and they will hunt those shots. That's a great point. You can't turn the ball over against them because they're going to find open looks then and they're going to bury some of them. Um, uh, offensively, I think this is a really interesting for a couple of reasons. I talked to the Sunbelt guy who covers the Sunbelt. He, he didn't seem that concerned about their lack of size. But watching some of Bickerstaff, their 6'9", kind of center forward, he's, he's their primary post defender, probably the guy who's going to be guarding Crowell. 6'9", 220 is going to be an issue for them, I think. Um, if if we get if we get aggressive Crowell, and as long as the refs aren't calling BS flops, which I, I, I hope that we don't see that when Crowell puts that shoulder down, but I think that's going to be an issue for them. And I can't wait to see, and Tyler Wall as well, I can't wait to see how we attack this defense. Yeah, no, and, you know, I, 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 listened, I listened to your show with the Sun Belt, and, it, you know, it was – I, I thought you brought up a good point because they didn't seem all concerned about because they like their two bigs, um, Baker Staff and and the, and the the other big they bring off the bench. But I agree, six nine is is different for because you've said it and we've watched it all year. When Crow faces a guy who's similar size or smaller, that's when Crow's had really big games. You know he struggles when he faces the guys that are the same size or even taller um, and more physical than he is um, or, you know, against Zach Eady, who's just an absolute monster. But, you know, when he's playing like opponents or less opponents, you know, crowds comfortable in that. And then I thought you brought up a really good point. I think where the Badgers have a big edge in this game is who throw it into crowd, but throw it in. Who's going to guard wall. How are they going to stop up wall? You know, Wall is really good in the post. Uh, he can create out of the post. I don't think James Madison in the Sun Belts has faced a guy like Tyler Wall, who is so good with his back to the basket, so good, you know, backing down, playing off a of crowd. You could put Crowl on the outside. Like, I don't think Bickerstaff's had to guard a lot of guys away from the basket. So if I was the Badgers, I'd look at pulling Crowl out getting Bicker staff away from the basket where he's not comfortable, what he's not used to or comfortable doing. And I would just really post, I would post wall and really see how, how they're going to, how, the, how are they going to guard that? I, I don't think they've seen somebody like Tyler wall's capability. And to your point, I think the officiating is going to play a big role, but I also think Tyler and Steven have to do a better job of not getting those silly fouls. Wall is, basically been in foul trouble the last what three or four games all in the big 10 tournament i think they need those guys on the floor walls got to stay out of foul trouble and crowds got to stay away from those one or two ticky tacks because if either of those guys get in foul trouble or off the floor uh that that plays in the jmu's hands because then you're talking about nolan and carter gilmore which i think they can give jmu problems too but i just don't think james madison has an answer for Wall and Crow, especially together. So I think staying out of foul trouble is of utmost importance for the Badgers on Friday night. 
Yeah, that's a good point, man. Because some of those calls against Wall were, were very ticky tacky, but when you have four fouls, you have to learn to not take some of those chances too, right? Like he fouled out on a block, but you probably didn't need that right there with four fouls, man, against Illinois, right? You stay in the game and maybe you win that game down the stretch. And the, Kral had a, a couple too, or in the stretch where he's had three fouls and he tries to reach around to strip a ball. Like you guys are veterans, man. Those are those are ticky yep. tack calls and risks you don't need to take. Um, let me ask you this because I'm always fascinated with Stephen Kral and I feel like I defend him a lot. Uh, even though he's he has flaws, like he's not a perfect player, it feels like there's a ton of pressure on him in this game. Like if if he doesn't play well against an undersized front court, and as you said, if the Badgers go as Stephen Crowell goes to some degree, uh, it almost feels like at times, and I don't want to make excuses for him, but it feels at times like it's almost an unfair burden to say we go as you go. And meanwhile, Chucky Hepburn can have like a one for seven game against Purdue, and it doesn't feel like other players are necessarily held to that same level of accountability. A hundred percent. I, I, you know, I, like you said, and I know you've been a big time defender of Crow, and, uh, but I, I think all your, I, I mean, I, you bring up, you bring up good points and I, I, I think, you know, Crow has off games and stuff, but so does Chucky, like Matt Max, thank God he's come out of it. But the last, you know, previous two, three weeks before Max was shooting in the, you know, in the 20%, you know, stores had games where, He's been off. Uh, um, you know, Tyler's had games where he's gone two two for eleven from from the uh, field or whatever. So you know, I, I think a lot gets put on Crow, um, but I think a lot of it does because when Crow is off, the Badgers seem off. So that has a lot to do with it. But I really think Crow is such a weapon. Like he doesn't even need to score. It's just the Badgers need to throw it into him and make JMU guard because i think you and i were talking at halftime of the illinois game uh, in the championship of the big 10 and i was frustrated because illinois in that first half got away with having hawkins guard wall in that first half and it's like there is no way walk hawkins can guard uh crowl i'm sorry can guard crowl in the post so and you saw the first six possessions of that second half and i give guard and his staff a heck of a lot of credit those first six possessions they threw it into the post to Stephen Crow on Hawkins, and the Badgers scored on their first six possessions. And one of the weapons Crow can score with his back to the basket, but a couple of those he kicked out. Now you got Store attacking a long closeout. He kicked out. You got Chucky shooting an uncontested three. You got Klesman shooting an uncontested three. I just think that that's where Crow I think is underappreciated is he can make plays and passes out of the post. So I just think when the Badgers get out of that where they have Crow more in the perimeter and they're more five out, I think that's where that the ball their offense gets a little stagnant and that ball movement we talked about earlier doesn't doesn't happen because I think they get too perimeter oriented. Where Stephen Crow, one of his great strengths is he can make a play out of the post. He he's a good he's an above average passer. You know, Wall can make plays out of the post. So I I just think posting the ball is really important. I would like to see him post, you know, Chucky post, post AJ store. Like, you know, they used to do in the swing when they ran more of the swing, but I just don't think, think JMU has played a team that will be able to post multiple guys. I think it really open stuff up for the Badgers. Yeah. And you mentioned the swing. It, we still get that reference once every game from an announcer talking about, oh, they like to run the swing. And I'm like, ah, this isn't the swing. They're not yes. running the swing anymore, yeah. guys. Like, you still get that reference every game. And it will probably will tell – probably tell – They haven't run, they haven't run that run. in, like, five years. Guys. Right. They're running, like, motion pick and roll. You know, they're like – and he, the, the announcer's like, look at that swing offense in action. I'm like, okay, we're, we're done here. Um, let me ask you this. What are your Yeah, they're running here? a basic five out. Like, like, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry I think we have a no, no worries. We have a bit of a leg, so I have to wait like a half second for you to come back. But, um, yeah, you're right. It's like a five-out motion. They're ready pick and roll. Like, they're not – anyway. What are your thoughts on the JMU game? Like, what is the what is your prediction? We're going to finish here. So, I, I, I think, you know, like I said, I think the first 10 minutes are important from the Badgers where they don't turn the ball over – and JMU, you know, gets out and, you know, gets up six or eight points, 
you know, I think if the Badgers can kind of just weather the storm early and just, you know, kind of slow it down, make it, make it a little more physical game and then slowly but surely just wear them down. Like you said, I think transition is huge. I just don't think, I'm not saying the batters can't get up and down with them. I just don't think you need to do that or they just don't feel fuel James Madison's offense. I just think the uglier the batters can make it earlier. And I just think they can just physically grind them down because, you know, you know, we saw it against what was it Cornell a couple of years ago where they fell behind 10 early in that first half. Like when you play these 12 seeds, 13 seeds or whatever, they feed off the emotion of the game. And the longer you let them hang around and, and give them confidence, then you got a real, you got a big problem on your hands. But I think if the Badgers stay true to themselves and like you and I talked about, really hammer it inside, I don't know. JMU, as good as they are, they got nobody who can guard AJ Store. So hopefully Store is in attack mode and he's not settling for perimeter jump shots. And I just think the Badgers just do what they do, wear them down, kind of slow it down a little bit, uh, make it more in an offensive efficiency game, and stay out of foul trouble. And I just don't think – I think body blow after body blow, a Big Ten team versus a Sun Belt team, I just think if the batters can consistently throw those body blows for the first – 25 to 30 minutes i you know I, I see it being close for a while but then maybe the badgers pull away you know in the the last you know eight plus minutes of the game and you know hopefully you know, you know i would say it's probably going to be within that six to ten point range i i don't think, think i'd be very surprised if the badgers you know blow them out you know obviously i would love for that to happen but i think it's going to be it's going to be a competitive close game, but I just think just wear them out, do what you do, you know, take a six to eight, 10 point win and get ready, get ready for Duke or Vermont. Yeah, I'm, I mostly agree with you. I think they'll grind them down. Yeah, by the way, the other thing that happens, right, you let that 12 seed stay in the game, that crowd starts to get involved and the crowd, crowd. Will always cheer for the 12 seed. They are Absolutely. Always and yeah, and you know, like you saw at Selection Sunday, Seth Davis and all these people, yep. like everybody, the, the dreaded five versus 12 game, even though it's more the six versus 11s, the 11s in the last five years have won a lot more than the the, the 12 seeds. Like the five seeds last year went 4-0. Um, but, you know, JMU's everybody's darling. You know, whenever you get a small school against a big school, you know, and that's why people, people love the two tournament you want to see those upsets especially on day one day two so like you said you let that crowd get into it they're always going to go they're always going to cheer for the 12 seed so you know that's a great point you make you know you just you don't want to get that momentum going against you yeah 100 agree all right he is coach gothier scott gothier jumping on the show for the second time um and i think he, he brings a lot of great insight which makes us a little smarter so coach as always i appreciate it um and we'll definitely talk after the show or after the game. We'll text during the game, I'm sure. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Ryan. Like I said, I love talking talking ball with you all the time, and I think you do a great job, and I really appreciate you having me. No, absolutely, man. Always welcome. Um, for Badger fans, thank you for tuning in. Uh, another show coming up tomorrow will be Nick Osen from 247 jumping on. Really excited for that one as well. And then we got the game. We'll obviously do the reaction show after. Hopefully it's a good one. Otherwise it will be miserable. But uh, we will talk to you then on Wisconsin, and we'll talk later.